So hi everyone, welcome to Magnets. Um, it says the 5th of June, but it's actually the 10th of July for this one. Um, just to let everyone know what our format will be. Many of you have be, been here before and know what we do, but just to let you know, um, we'll have a 25 to 30 minute presentation. Uh, during this time, all of you, it'd be best if you keep your microphones muted. Uh, and if you're struggling to watch, turn off your video, that can help. Um, after that, we'll have 10 to 15 minutes for questions and discussion. You can either ask a question in the chat box or you can turn on your camera and microphone and ask it. Um, raise your hand for asking a question. And then at the end, we'll turn off the recording and there'll be some time for catch up um, and everyone can have a chat. Um, so today we've got Evie Baker and she's going to talk to us about her price arc based CRM model um, to simulate uh, chemical remnants. Um, and she's at the Department of Earth Sciences now at the University of Oxford. I wanted to make sure that I got that right on the presentation. Um, so oh, that's it, I think, for now. Uh, we'll hand over to Evie and I'll stop the share and she can start sharing. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about work that I did during my um, PhD, which was at Imperial, and now I'm doing a, a postdoc at Oxford. Um, so I'm interested in trying to model CRM behavior and trying to understand what we see in natural samples. Um, so kind of as a brief overview, uh, CRMs are recorded in two different ways. So rocks can record external magnetic fields either uh, when they grow, so the nucleation growth of magnetic minerals inside a non-magnetic matrix is called a grain growth CRM. Um, there's also an alteration CRM, which is when magnetic minerals alter to other magnetic minerals. And these alteration CRMs are complicated by exchange interactions between the primary and secondary magnetic phase. Um, so for my work, I'm interested in um, pointer. I'm interested in grain growth CRMs because these are the simplest to model. And there's still so much we don't know about CRMs. We wanted to start with the simplest case. Um, my model is, or our model is looking at CRM acquisition in weakly interacting single domain systems. So that's a system where we have, um, when the grains are very small, they have a very high thermal energy. So the magnetic moment is going to flip. And then um, and the energy barrier to rotation is, is very small. And then as they grow through the blocking volume, they become locked in one orientation as that energy barrier um, becomes too high. So this is the CRM acquisition that I've uh, been modeling. So CRMs are particularly important and they're becoming even more important um, in meteorite um, studies. So when we're trying to investigate uh, early solar system evolution, a large portion of primitive meteorites carry CRMs that are required during the formation of magnetic minerals, such as magnetite, during aqueous alteration. So a large portion of these carry uh, grain growth CRMs, and we use their intensities to uh, look at the structure of the protoplanetary disk, and this has consequences for planet formation and uh, solar system evolution models. So it's very important that we can get reliable paleo intensities and actually understand the CRMs that we're um, uh, putting into these models and using the data from. So I'm interested in, well, how well do we actually currently understand CRM behavior and can we can we get reliable intensities or you know what, what more is there to, to know? So there has been a lot of work on CRMs already, um, and this has come from a modeling perspective where people have done uh, Monte Carlo simulations of interacting single domain systems, and they've looked at CRM to TRM ratios and the behavior of CRMs during processes such as thermal demagnetization. Um, and there's also been a lot of experiments, um, and these have looked at different minerals such as hematite, gregite, and magnetite, uh, and some of them have looked at CRM to TRM ratios, but in general, they tend to focus on CRM intensities normalized to IM isothermal lab remnants. And this is because a lot of these samples alter during heating. So whereas modeling has mainly focused on how CRMs compare to TRMs, the experiments have focused on CRMs compared to isothermal remnants. So it's hard to do one-to-one -one comparisons between the current models and um, the current experiments. So I'm trying to kind of bridge that gap and and kind of compare the two directly. Um, yeah, so the way that we 
did this is we developed a CRM acquisition model, which was based on Pryzik theory, um, which was based on a TRM uh, Pryzik model, which was successfully used to represent TRM acquisition in uh, basalt. And we can use this to um, explore how different acquisition conditions and different sample properties can affect CRM um, intensity and behavior. Um, and then we can also use this to make direct comparisons to natural and experimental samples from the literature. Uh, so I'm going to briefly introduce the model, which is in uh, Pryzik space. So the model uses a thermally activated uh, Pryzik, uh, Pryzik model for weakly interacting single domain grains. So for those who aren't that familiar with Pryzik theory, it's a pictorial method to represent magnetic systems uh, and each point on Pryzik space is represented by a histone. So I've shown a couple of examples here, and that histone um, represents an individual uh, particle. And the axes are the flipping fields of the histones, which are also, you can think of, they're also the interactions axis here and the cohesivity. So the same as a fork diagram, if your fork diagram was only measuring single domain uh, grains. And we can populate Pryzik space by using a Pryzik distribution, uh, which can be thought of as a symmetrical fork diagram. And we can use this as a probability density function to weight um, the, the histones depending on how, how high their fork distribution is. So this allows us to populate Pryzik space um, with sample with, with like with properties which represent a particular sample. And we can use Pryzik space to model magnetic processes because each histone has its own thermal critical barriers, which are these lines here. Um, and these depend on properties such as temperature, uh, applied field, and also the particle properties. So things like the cohesivity, the interactions, and the volume of the part of the particle represented by the histone. And depending on where the histone lies relative to its thermal critical barriers controls its magnetic state. So if a particle lies inside this super prime magnetic region here, then it's going to have high thermal activation and have no long term uh, magnetic remnants. If it lies in these field blocked regions, it's either positively or negatively magnetized. And that's because the large interactions have shifted the histone. And if it lies in this green region, which is the bit we're most interested in, uh, then it's going to requ have acquired a magnetic remnant dependent on its thermal um, history. So when a particle, when a histone crosses into the remnants region, it will acquire a magnetization with, an, with a probability of being aligned with the field, which is how we get uh, the magnetizations. So now I'm going to show how we can use Pryzik space to model serum acquisition and what it kind of looks like pictorially. Um, so we're going to look at how the thermal critical curves change with increases in time and therefore volume, and also how the Pryzik distribution moves. So when our grains first nucleate, they're very small, which means that the thermal critical curves are very wide, and the Pryzik the Pryzik distribution lies within the super prime magnetic uh, region. And as the grains grow, they increase in uh, interactions, so they start to stretch out in this axis, and they also begin to cross into the remnants region as the thermal critical curves contract. And when they've reached their final volume, the majority of the hist uh, histones now lie inside this remnants region, and they've acquired a CRM. Also worth noting, uh, this is the shift from the applied field, so this means you end up with more being positively magnetized than, than negatively. And then once we turn off our field, uh, we can sum up the magnetization of all of the histones in here to give us our overall CRM. So this is how we can model CRM acquisition in, in Pryzik space. So the first thing we did is we used this model to look in, to kind of explore the parameter space and look at how CRMs might be responding to properties such as growth rate, interactions, et cetera. Um, so the intensity of a CRM is predominantly controlled by the blocking volume of the grains of, of, of each individual histone. Um, and this depends on, so if you have a larger blocking volume, then the um, particle is has a higher probability of align, aligning with the applied field and therefore a higher intensity. So we can look at how properties will change the blocking volume and mainly change, change the intensity. Um, oh, I should also note that we've normalized everything to a saturation uh, magnetization, which we also modeled in Pryzik space for each distribution. So to look at different sample properties, we can change the input Pryzik distributions into our model. So here, PN1 has a very low cohesivity, 
uh, and PN2 has a higher coercivity. So if we look from the blue to the orange, we can see that as we increase our um, coercivity, we decrease our CRM intensity. And this is because the higher coercivity particles block at um, smaller, sometimes they block at smaller volumes and we get a reduced, uh, a reduced intensity for higher coercivities for these single domain grains. Um, we can also look at the effect of external factors like growth rate. So as we decrease the growth rate and increase the time available for growth of these particles, we see that we get an increase in CRM intensity. And this is because when you increase the growth time, uh, the particles have longer to equilibrate with the applied field at each growth step and time step. And this leads to larger blocking volumes. And we can see that this effect is slightly uh, decreased for strongly interacting systems. So this is this PW, so wide uh, distribution. Uh, and this is because when the particles block at larger volumes, uh, volumes are proportional to interactions, so they also have more interactions. And this increases the number of particles that block in that field block regions because of their uh, large interactions and reduces the amount in the remnants region, which gives us a slight reduction in the uh, in the CLM intensity. Um, so we can also... so. Uh, a really useful part of this model is that we can directly compare CRMs to TRMs for the same um, input Prysic distributions. So as I mentioned previously oh, on the last slide, CRM intensity decreases as we increase interactions. Um, however, it decreases a lot less than a TRM. Um, and this is because TRMs uh, are, are required when the samples are fully grown. So the grains are much larger and therefore the interactions are larger. So they're a lot more sensitive to interactions than a CRM. Because in our CRM model, uh, the particles block at about 4% of their final volume. So the interactions are much, much smaller and the effects that aren't as big. Um, so that's kind of a brief overview of the parameter space that we've explored. Um, and what we see is that we get a range in CRM to TRM ratios between 0.3 and 1.2. So that's changing the growth rate from, I think it's about a thousand seconds to 10,000 years. Um, and also looking at temperatures up to 500 degrees C. Um, so these are kind of the, the, the trends that we see. And this is consistent with previous models that have looked at weekly interacting uh, single domain grains. So you can see this uh, study by Sherbakov and colleagues found that the CLM is less affected by interactions. Um, and this, this kind of suggests that it's important to look at it looks like the CM to TM ratio isn't constant between different samples. So it's important to see to think about how this might be affected by temperature when we're trying to get paleo intensities from CRMs. Um, so now I want to compare the results of this model directly to experimental and natural samples. Uh, so the way that we do this is because the model uses an, uh, a prize distribution to represent the sample, we can replace this with a measured fork diagram. So the measurements that we do are we measure a fault diagram for the sample, we measure the NRM and the SIRM, or the AF demagnetization spectra of those, and we model CRM and SIRM in Prysic space using the fault diagram as the experimental input to represent our sample. And then we can directly compare the ratios of the two. Um, so now we need to find some suitable samples. So for natural samples, we needed... Uh, we needed samples where the magnetic field, where we know the magnetic field that's been recorded. So we want recent samples that have acquired their magnetization in the last 100 years or so when we've got instrumental uh, data. So we took samples from the Norfolk salt marshes. Um, and these salt marshes have been shown by aerial photography to be less than 100 years old. So they're really recent. And in these black um, anoxic sediments, uh, previous studies have found evidence of, of Gregite. And also they have these concretions, which are kind of cemented blocks, which lie in these anoxic layers. And these have previously been seen to have uh, particularly high levels of Gregite up to about 5%. Um, and also they're a lot more kind of cemented. So this is what we were, yeah. So we went to sample these and I'm gonna, this isn't really the focus, but I'm just gonna give you a very brief overview of some of the magnetic measurements or data that we found to try and convince you that we have a CRM uh, chi by Gregite. So the four diagrams show that we have stable magnetic recorders um, and they are consistent with previous studies of Gregite. So especially these concretions, which are thought to have, which are thought to be predominantly Gregite concentrated, um, 
these fault diagrams look quite similar to, to what we what we expect for single domain uh, Gregite in natural samples. Uh, also, all of our samples acquired a Gyro remnant uh, magnetization during AFD magnetization, um, which is uh, very common in, in Gregite sediments. And it's not often seen elsewhere. It can be, but not, not often. Uh, yeah, so we thought that was kind of our one of our smoking guns. Um, we also saw abundant iron sulfides in all the samples that we looked at on the SEM. Um, and all of these look like they have this orthogenic texture. So it looks like they formed in situ inside the host, host rocks. Um, so for example, this kind of cluster in this concretion looks like it's formed and then other minerals have formed around it. So it's like it's been forming during the, during the formation of this concretion. Um, and we made a first order estimate on the composition of these by looking at the iron to sulfur ratio in the EDX analysis, which suggests that they look more like pyrite. They have ratios of about 0.5. Um, and this is expected because they're quite big grains. We wouldn't expect, uh, I mean, yeah, we wouldn't expect our single domain gregite to have grain sizes of on the order of like 500 nanometers. Um, yeah, so we saw lots of iron sulfides, and in natural samples, gregite is very often associated with pyrite. So magnetically, we saw evidence of gregite, and then we saw all this iron sulfides in our SEM analysis. Uh, and also, we found that the sediments which were orientated recorded the magnetic field direction. Um, so here you can see our average direction in blue, and this is the Earth's magnetic field over the last 100 years for this locality. Uh, which suggests that they've recorded these sediments and concretions have recorded a CRM and it's reliably recorded the Earth's field direction. So it should have also recorded the Earth's field intensity as well. So now I'm going to look at how it compares to the model. Um, so the, I've focused on the concretion samples because they're the ones that look like they were predominantly uh, containing gregite. And we can see that the modeled, which is this dash line, is five to ten times higher than the measured ratios, which are these solid lines. Um, which is interesting. I'm going to discuss reasons why that might be the case. But first, I'm going to look at comparing it to experimental samples. So for this, um, we looked at we looked at the literature, and there was this really good study that came out last year, and um, by Marella and Gattacheka, which was altering pyrite inside sedimentary rocks to magnetite at high temperatures, and they found that the magnetite um, formed inside these pyrite framboids and also on the exterior of uh, pyrite grains. And they also measured fault diagrams, which shows that they've got stable magnetic carriers. And they also measured CRM and SIRM. So they measured everything that we need to compare to our model. Um, so yeah, this was this was perfect. So we compared this to our model in the same way that we compared the Gregite. And we also see again um, that the uh, modeled intensities are higher, two to four times higher this time, than the measured ratios. I've put this dashed line on because this is about where, um, in their, their paper, where the primary CRM was isolated. So we're kind of interested in the ratio kind of beyond the, this, this point. Um, yeah, and we see it's still, it's still a bit high. Um, and this was seen across the board. There was a couple of samples where it wasn't the case, but this was the general trends that we saw for most of our samples. So this made me think, well, why, what, what is it that's not working in the model? Why is the model not representing natural and experimental samples? So there's two kind of general possibilities. One, it's an aspect of the model. So I thought it could be the growth mechanism. Uh, so in the model, um, all the, the largest grains nucleate first, and then they all finish growing at the final time, which means that a lot of the larger grains tend to block earlier. So I thought, well, a lot of previous studies of gregite formation uh, have theorized um, that you get burst nucleation. So all the grains nucleate at once. Um, so I tested this and depending on which growth mechanism I used, I found maybe a 5% difference in intensity. So this was only, this wasn't having a significant effect. Only, it only affected the lowest coercivity grains. So the alternative hypothesis is, well, are these experimental and natural CRMs that I've compared to actually represented by weakly interacting single domain grains um, that I'm modeling. So there's two aspects to this. One is the type of interactions. Do I have the same type of interactions in the model? So weak as I do in my natural samples or are there stronger interactions in my natural samples? And then the second aspect is have the particles uh, in the natural samples grown into single vortex, multi vortex sizes. 
because I'm only modeling single domain grain. So if they're growing larger, then that's not that's not the mechanism that I'm modeling anymore. So we can test this. Uh, and I tested this by uh, quantifying how well the uh, how well the SIOM compared between the med modeled and measured data. So SIOM acquisition has been um, previously modeled in Isaac Space successfully for weekly interacting uh, samples. So I uh, compared the two. So this is for my natural Greg concretion samples. This is actually the closest one I, I got. This was my best um, my best result. Um, and what we can see is there is a, a, a difference here between the normalized SIM spectra, um, which have been normalized between the first, the average of the first three points to not put a lot of weighting on one particular value. Um, and we can see they are a bit different. Um, and we can actually quantify this difference by using these SIOM checks. So one is looking at the absolute difference between the modeled or simulated and measured. And then the second is looking at the ratio of the two. And we can see that they they get quite large and they're also out of these. So these bounds were previously used by Anita and, and colleagues um, to see if a sample was well represented. Um, so I've put them on as a guide to, to see that, okay, no, these are these don't look like they're well represented by the model. And I see the same trends when I compare to the um, uh, magnetite samples from Morel and Gattacheca. So this suggests that the magnetic remnants in these measured samples is not carried by weakly interacting single domain grains. So I'm gonna discuss what the differences would be if they were larger grains, <clears throat> and also if they have stronger interactions, and if either of these processes can, can explain the differences that we're seeing in the model. So firstly, if we look at growing beyond single domain size, so in the model, uh, sorry, so in the natural samples, the GCRM is originally going to be acquired as the particles grow through the blocking volume. But then if they continue growing, they're going to grow into vortex states, and we don't yet know how that transition <clears throat> um, is going to affect the CRM, especially given that a lot of these orthogenic magnetic minerals form quite equidimensional grains the hard axis of the single vortex state in that kind of unstable zone might actually be quite important, which might, which is, um, which is going to be, a, I mean, no matter what, this is a different process than what I've modeled, which is only looking at the single domain size. And then to compound this, the SIOM in the natural samples is going to be acquired at full size, which is going to be acquired in a vortex state, which is a different process to what I'm modeling again. So it's not quite yet known how this will affect the CRM to SIM ratio, but it is likely to have an effect. Um, the effect of interactions, I can have a go at quantifying a little bit, a little bit more. Um, so the model contains weak interactions, which are quite weak on, on, on strength. And this is when you increase your concentration, um, you increase the spread of the Physic or fork diagram in the interactions axis. And interactions are proportional to volume and interactions proportional to, to concentration. And I'm using interactions proportional to volume as a proxy. Um, and what we see is that, so these interactions are kind of one to tens of milliteslas, uh, whereas the samples, both samples that I compared my results to, so the iron sulfides often show clusters. And although I didn't image the gregite, um, pretty much every study I've looked at of SEM of Gregite has shown these strongly interacting clusters. And also in the experimental magnetite samples from Erlingata Cheka, their images also show that you've got magnetite forming inside these pyrites, and it looks like this magnetite is, is quite clustered. And if you have touching grains, you can get magnetostatic interactions up to about 200 millitesla for Gregite. Um, so these interactions are significantly stronger than what's in the model. <clears throat> So I made a first order approximation of how this might, of, of a, a model of how this might be affecting the CRM to SIRM uh, intensities. So in the model, we only have weakly interacting single domain grains. So these single domain grains acquire a CRM in the weak uh, Earth's field. And then when we apply the SIRM, they become saturated. So that's our simple case. We've got the same grains carrying the CRM and the same grains carrying the SIRM. Whereas I'm hypothesizing that in the samples, we may have kind of as an end member scenario, we may have a mixture of these weakly interacting single domain grains. But we also seem to have a lot of strongly interacting clusters or framboidal grains. 
Now, when we apply our weak Earth's field, the single domain grains will record a COM of, of that field, but the interactions are so strong in these ramboids, it could be that they're not seeing that Earth's field. They're only, their magnetization is pretty much completely controlled by their by the interactions of the grains around them. So they're not carrying a record of the CRM. However, when we apply our SIRM, which is a very strong field, we are saturating the single domain, but we are also saturating these clusters and framboids because the field that we're applying is stronger than the interactions within these clusters. So this could cause a reduction in the CRM to SIRM of measure samples co compared to the model. However, uh, it's worth noting at least that um, these framboids tend to form these closure domains, which means that they have a very weak um, overall magnetic moment. So for this kind of, for the framboids to have this effect, we need a, we probably need a lot of them in our, in our samples. Um, and one of the type of interactions that could be having a difference is dynamic interactions. So this is when, so previously this has all been focusing on static interactions. But when you have a large number of super pi magnetic grains close together, they can interact dynamically, which can lead to collective blocking of the whole system or spin glass state system um, spin glass states. Now, not enough is known about this to kind of accurately uh, model what might be happening, but it is definitely likely to be. If it's happening, it's going to have probably quite a significant effect. So that's another thing to to think about for the for the future. Um, so I've suggested that the samples that I tested on, the model predicted higher intensities than we measured because of strong interactions in the measured samples, which weren't included in the model. Now, I think this is probably reasonably widespread as well in natural samples. So in marine sediments, again, as I mentioned, you see gregite kind of clustering together. In red bed, you see hematite that's formed inside cracks. Again, it looks pretty clustered. And also in these meteorites, which is where we're most interested in looking at CRMs, it looks like at least a portion of the CR of, of the magnetite or the magnetic minerals form these uh, clusters of interacting grains. And this is a really nice image where you can actually see the interaction fields and you can see that they're all interacting together and forming these superstructures. So interactions are important in natural CRMs. And it suggests that the current CRM to TRM ratios are probably going to be underestimating field intensity because the models that people are using aren't including these strong interactions. Um, so what's what what what's next to understand CRM behavior further? Well, given that my work, I believe we've kind of we've isolated one issue potentially being these strong interactions, more microgenetic modeling trying to quantify these interactions and think about how they might be affecting a strong field remnants as opposed to a weak field remnants. And also just looking at more CRM experiments. There's been a lot of CRM experiments in recent years, um, which is, I think, is very interesting and really good. Um, but a lot of them are at temperatures which are different to how CRMs are, are actually been acquired in nature. So I think it's it'll be good to try and look at lower temperatures because that's what we see in meteorites where we're most, um, or in some meteorites where we're particularly interested in looking at the CRMs. And a lot of all the modeling that I've done and other people have done shows that temperature probably has quite a strong effect on that ratio. Um, so it would be good to see, you know, we need kind of more experiments looking at, at lower temperatures. But this is difficult to reproduce these conditions in the lab. It's not it's not an easy thing to, to do. Uh, yeah, so just a quick summary is that we found that the model is stronger than the measured, and this is likely due to interactions. And this is probably a widespread um, phenomenon issue in CRMs. Uh, that's all I've got. Thank you. Thanks, Evie. That was a great talk. Um, if everyone could give you a virtual round of applause, I think that'd be really good. Um, so at this point, um, I'll open the floor to ask some questions. I definitely have some, um, mm -hmm. but I will, our guests can, uh, raise their hands or they can put a question in the chat for Evie if they want to. Um, Win, go ahead. Uh, great talk, great talk Evie, yeah. So um, when you were going through that, uh, the obvious thing was these uh, framboidal structures and, uh, and the fact that um, they're likely to have very large interactions. Now, 
there's a very underused model, which is um, Rich, uh, Rich Harrison's kind of forculator. Probably it wouldn't take much modification of that to test out these strong interactions. Uh, so I think you should, uh, yeah, give him a call and see how easy, I mean, it's written in this ridiculous Igor language, which uh, Rich seems to love. But uh, I think it would be really worthwhile um, testing that out. Of course, almost any mechanism you think of is going to reduce the CRM, right? Interactions all going to larger grain sizes. And the, the inheritance of uh, the main structures being single domain and vortex structures is an interesting thing to, to look at too. But all, all these and the interactions really require some sort of numerical um, modeling. But I think uh, there's a lot of potential in that. Yeah, but I thought it was uh, really interesting. Yeah, I've written that down. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I've not, I've not, I've thought about the micromagnetics, but I've not thought about the forculator. So that would be good. Yeah, I think so. that's an easy win. So, yeah. So I guess, oh, we've got a hand up from Clara. Uh, hey. Thanks yeah. a lot. That was a very interesting and a very easy to understand talk. So thank you. I was just curious if your uh, Prezak model could help, could simulate what happens when you have a potential heritage from a parent uh, grain, let's say metal for us doing meteorites that mm -hmm. alters into magnetite. And if you could make prediction of what would happen to any remnants uh, of the metal with your model. Um, it's something I've thought about. I don't, I don't know. So the Pisic model tends to work by looking at how the how the interaction coercivity of an individual particle changes through time. So it's based on the kind of Nial relaxation time equation. Um, so it's, it is only really valid for weakening parts of single domain grain. So I think if you're if you're having kind of a sudden change in 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 coercivity, I I don't think it's the right model to to do that with. I mean, maybe, but I yeah, I, I don't think so. What would be what would be the right model? <laughs> I mean, I would assume micromagnetic um, for more complex things. I think I think there was something looking at te tetratainite recently using micromagnetics. I think, um, but yeah, I don't know. I have never done any of that. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. Yeah, we have another question from Edward Petrovsky. Uh, to the previous question, I'm quite skeptical about uh, the, the ability of this model to show something about uh, heritage. It shows the statistical image of present situation. Even to understand the physics behind that is a bit uh, tricky and because it's simply mathematical statistics, the representation in terms of, of the distribution of hysterons. And it really shows many the present situation. It's very difficult to to, to say what was before and what will follow in the future. So that's, uh, I'm, I'm quite skeptical about it. But anyway, thanks mm -hmm. so for, for a very nice talk. That's right. Thank you, Edward. Yeah, no, I, I agree on its abilities being, yeah, I don't think it can, I don't think it could do an alteration. I don't think. Yes, I, I have a question because we've talked a lot about what the model can't be used for <laughs> um but i think that there are situations where it, it probably can be used like in sort of mm -hmm. grain growth uh tcrms in like lava flows and stuff like that um have you kind of tried looking at maybe some some kind of more the, the more sort of standard things that people look at in paleomag where you might have a grain growth tcrm um, so and does that does that behave a bit better? Uh, so numerically, we looked at the effect of, we looked at TCRM. So we looked at a simple case of TCRMs where we grew the grains at a high temperature and then cooled them in a field. Um, 
so when I when I was doing this, I think I was maybe slightly ambitious and wanted this sample where we had where we knew the exact field. And I think that it would be good to test this on yeah basalt samples where you think that you've got a high temperature CRM, um, which I haven't done, but I think it might be it's more likely to be applicable there. And you know as long as we know the ballpark of the Earth's field, which hopefully we can guess is between like thirty and sixty in general. We can, you know, that's probably that that would be it would be worth testing it. And I chatted to Andy about Andy Biggins about some potential things to look at there. So I think that's something that's definitely very doable. And yeah, it might it might fare better, or it should. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right. Are you you all seeing that? Great. Um so um just to kind of give you everyone an update on future seminars um we've got speakers lined up for 24th and the 7th so every two weeks and then after that there's a slot available on the 21st and then i think we're pretty much booked up until december um as a reminder to everyone um you can catch any seminars that you don't watch on youtube um and the link's there and yeah we've got a lot of presentations to view now